Welcome to STEMiverse Podcast, episode 22. In this episode, Peter and Marcus talk with Saskia and Alistair. This is the second part of the Barker College Redbacks team interview. If you haven't listened to the first part in which we interview Leo Grant, the team coordinator, please do so now before listening to this second part. Everything will make more sense then. In this episode, we'll hear from Saskia and Alistair. Saskia is a current member of the team and one of the team captains. She's a year 11 student. And Alistair is a team alumni and now an engineering student. Saskia and Alistair talked about life and learning as a competitive robotics team member. This is STEMiverse, podcast episode 22. Welcome to STEMiverse, the podcast that helps educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. I am Peter Dunmaris, and with my co-host, Marcus Sharpie, our mission is to bring you the experiences of educators, students, and stakeholders who strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. So here we are. Um, we've got a few more guests in, in the room, so would, would you like to introduce yourselves to our audience? Who are you? Uh, hi, I'm Alistair. Um, I finished at Barker last year. I was involved in the program um, from year 9 to year 12. I now study at Macquarie University. I'm Saskia. I'm a year 11 student at Barker College, and I've been with the Barker College robotics team since year 10. Right. How do you like it? Uh, I've really enjoyed being involved in the program. I've been involved sort of since the beginning of the program at Barker, so I've sort of seen it evolve and, and grow, which is really good. It's always good to see positive impact that you make, and it's had a big impact on me. I certainly learned a lot, but also about teamwork and sort of helped me identify that I was interested in, you know, engineering and the subjects that I was interested in sort of pursuing. Mm-hmm. Did you volunteer? Did they make you do it? It was... So I think I ended up joining because someone announced in school assembly uh, we were looking for people to, to join, and that was back when the team had about five or six students. Yeah. Um, and they were looking to grow, and it was a really good opportunity. But why did you really decide to join? Was it because oh, I can skip classes? <laughs> oh, not because the, it, they were presenting, and they drove a robot down the aisle <laughs> there was of the assembly hall, <laughs> and it so, looked fun. And yep, yep, yeah, yep, I'm that was it. That. Awesome. What, what about you, Saskia? I found it fantastic. It set me up for so many opportunities like this and going overseas to America and talking to heaps of unis and also setting me up for education, which is further. It helped me figure out what I want to do after school, which is engineering. Um, It's also helped me with organisation and leadership, which is really important in later in life. And it's just improved my mechanical skills and technical Mm -hmm. skills. So what was the first, did, did you have the same experience? I would start with the robot coming down and um, getting impressed by it. No, so I started in uh, robotics in year nine at Abbotsley. They had a very new team. Mm-hmm. So I kind of helped with sponsorship on that, but I didn't really get involved with the technical side. Then I moved to Barker in year 10 to join my brother's at school. And then I got into the team and I started right. thinking more mechanically and technical. So you had your prior experience and you wanted to continue with that because yes. well, you enjoyed it, obviously. Uh, yes, definitely. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so, Alistair, you've finished. Yep. Now you are studying. What do you study? Uh, you mechatronics. 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 Yeah. Good boy. So, <laughs> <laughs> Marcus. I studied mechatronics, but I never finished it. Yes. <laughs> but I did a giant hack. <laughs> it's a big story. Yeah, we really got to do it. So, do you think that there's a connection between your experience at Barker and then deciding to study mechatronics? Oh, uh, definitely. So, sort of before I joined robotics, I was mm-hmm. actually looking into going to the Defence Force. Mm-hmm. And this sort of helped me identify that I could probably do it a little bit more than that and I could maybe broaden my horizons. So, it's, yeah, it's really helped me with that. But also, I've become more interested in engineering-related things out of school and also science as well. Did you do cadets? Yeah. How did you do both cadets and this at the same time? That's insane. <laughs> I ended up giving up uh, cadets in year 11 in order to continue robotics. And I was sort of given the option by my parents to either keep cadets or keep robotics. Obviously, robotics is, time-wise, is, you know, hugely more. Mm-hmm. Um, but by getting rid of one, it allowed me to focus on the other rather than having to split my time. 
So that's what you were saying earlier, like about right. choices that students have to do in order to balance everything, right? Absolutely. And a lot of our students, they choose a lot of co-curriculars, right? So our students are often doing robotics, plus doing sport, plus doing potentially music, debating, mm-hmm. and a bunch of other things. So at some point, it usually comes down to a decision about what do you want to focus on. Um, but for a lot of our students, they do manage to balance it somehow. Yeah. Is that how it works for you, Saskia? Uh, yeah, so I'm pretty senior in cadets, so I'm third in charge um, and I'm also um, helping with robotics so I do find it's a lot of work um, but if you're good with your time management you can handle it. Yeah. Suski's being a little bit humble she's actually was one of our team captains she's just not sure because we're in that transition period to the next team that's coming through. Oh, things are always changing like I understand that there's you do have to put a lot of time in the robotics and everything that comes with it there's, there's six, uh, is it six weeks? For the, that, for the direct build season, uh, okay, it's six yeah. weeks, and, and then, then there's about another really. six weeks of competition after that, where it's all from January through about the end of April. Yeah. It's incredibly time consuming. So how do you balance that stress, the six weeks especially, with everything else that has to take place within your studies? You've got other subjects, you've got your cadetship. Um, so you really have to make sure that you've got a set timetable, especially for study, um, and make sure that you're not falling behind. Um, but with this year, I was so heavily involved that I did um, have quite a few extensions on my subjects with assessments uh, that mm-hmm. meant, like, meant that I was able to catch up without getting too stressed. So in other words, teachers will help you? Yeah. Uh, because they understand that you're, under, you're really carrying a lot of load on your shoulders, so you will get an extension in an assignment that's due or in an yeah. exam. And the teachers have been incredibly understanding so that I've been going to yeah. <laughs> from the team, right? Yeah. Yeah, something important for anybody listening to take into account. Like, yeah, yep. deadlines are not meant to be deadlines. So, obviously for me, um, university is a bit more flexible. Mm. So, this year I was able to put quite a lot of time in, especially as it doesn't really start until um, beginning of March. So, Bill's Day runs from early January to sort of middle February. So, I had all that period I could focus on this. Last year in year 12, I actually didn't do very much during the build season. I was like, the school and, you know, most schools are a lot less hesitant to give you extensions and things when, when you're in year 12 because it's really important that you keep up that consistent work like, throughout the year. So I, I took a step back with a lot of our year 12 students around this year. Um, that helped me focus on the studies. If you're not a backup student anymore, if I understand right, why are you here? Yeah, I was going to ask, how did you make that transition from being a maker oh, to a mentor? Yeah. I've actually, oh, I've really enjoyed now, right? being in the program, yeah, and I've, I've seen the benefits that it's given me and also a lot of other students which have been involved in it. So I'm like, you know, I can teach other people that or I can show them that. Mm. And I really get enjoyment through doing that. So you're here helping like the current crop of students mm-hmm. with yeah. problems that you experienced yourself as you're going through it. Yeah, exactly. Can you give some examples of um, things that you help kids? Yeah, so with, I've kind been of students with? recently I've been running sort of series of CAD workshops, so computer aided design in SolidWorks. Yep. Um, and there wasn't really much network for me to and uh, ability for me to do that when I was in the team because it, it was you know back a few years when it wasn't so organised. So I actually I actually ended up teaching myself you know SolidWorks. I'm just playing around and it wasn't really like an effective thing. Even now there are still things that I'm not really sure and I'm learning from doing those workshops. So. I really like having the opportunity to, you know, teach students mm. the CAD the thing I really like um, and, you know, showing them that, you know, there's a really good, they can design robots with that and it's also got this wealth of other possibilities. Um, like, what for one of the exercises, one of the students actually end up, like, using the, a sheet metal function to design a pizza box. Mm. So it's really opening. <laughs> so they, they realise that the way all these different things are designed, like a pizza box is just folded up, a, a single sheet of colour yeah. folded up, and through using those tools, they can design and, and work out how all the different things sort of fold together. So all the peppers in CAD, right, in computer aided yes. design? Yeah, we use SolidWorks. Yeah. Mainly. So is that the software that you learned as you were going through the program? And, that, and then now you are teaching it to, uh, to the current crop of students? Yeah, I, I learned it as I was going through the program, um, but I sort of learned it myself. Yeah. Does um, Barker still have a CAD program? Like yeah. In my day, it used to be Bentley MicroStation. That's what they taught us in CAD. So there's, no, it's things. obviously changed a huge amount. So over at Design Technology, they do that. When I first learned, was introduced to it in Year 7, they were using Pro Engineer, which is a sort of a really old software program. And then we changed to Katia. 
um, which is a really good program for sort of solid modeling and for contouring. Mm -hmm. And then we changed uh, to SolidWorks and that was when I sort of stopped doing DT. So I wasn't really exposed to the, the SolidWorks side of things. And now they're using Inventor. So right. in the past few years, they've been through about five different software packages. <laughs> they're also using 3ds Max right now. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. That's awesome. Yeah. So you use whatever tool is I suppose Helpful. the best at the time, right? right? You, right. you don't say I'm going to use this for the next 10 years. Yep. It's flexible according to what they need. I think they're moving to Inventor mainly because the HSM that's connected to it is so effective for mm. CNC routering and things like that. It depends on the task as well. So there's a program called Vitio. It's really good for one of the things they used to do, which was F1 in schools. It's basically the, the software is perfect for you know the modeling of the and contouring of the outside. But when they're changing more of a parametric approach, like design things like chairs, solid work is more appropriate. Mm. And also for the 3ds Max, sort of like that's like an animation tool, yep. um, which enables people to you know create animations and develop their skills and sort of CGI. You know, so it's really important. You know, they can watch a movie and they can use a similar tool to, to see how they do each effect mm -hmm. and they make the, the object move. So that's really interesting. Wow, Saskia, could you tell us about your specialization? What do you do in the robotics team? Um, so I was mostly on the mechanical team for this year, uh, so I helped with the design of the climber on the 2017 bot and I helped guide the students building it and designing it and carrying out and having the final products, but I was also on the leadership team, so I helped the organisation and the day-to-day -day running of the team, so to make sure that everyone has the right job and we're not having people standing around doing nothing. And where did you learn those skills? I kind of yes. just picked them up on the way. <laughs> okay. I kind of just, so cadets did help me with my leadership definitely, uh, but throughout the build season, it was kind of just trial and error of what worked for the team mm -hmm. organization wise. Uh, and we kind of sorted them out. I had a co-captain called Kaylin, So we worked together to help each other and help the team. Cool. So you self thought in a lot of what you do in the team? Uh, like you obviously get help, but. Yep, so you drive your own learning, that's what I'm saying. Yes, mostly with the organisation and leadership, but with the mechanical, I was definitely taught by the mentors and students. So you have the mentors there to support you? I suppose they don't, they don't give a lecture on here's how to use a software. Maybe they do, I don't know. Or do you actively find your own sources, your own materials? It could be YouTube videos, it could be books, uh, users' manuals. Uh, no, so what we did in 2016, it was the first year that we uh, kind of did it, was big workshops. So we would have workshops for mechanical tools like the lathe downstairs and the mill. And you'd kind of work up in levels. So you have level one, two, and you'd have specialist mm. levels. So it would mean that people get hands-on time with the materials and yet have to pass tests to make sure that the students were able to use the tool safely and properly. Mm -hmm. So then uh, we use those also with CAD and with programming, and we found that really helpful to make sure every student is up to their full potential. Leila, is that what you were talking about earlier with the badges, badges system? Yeah, we don't actually... I don't know that we've actually got an OHS badge as right. such, but <laughs> or WHS now. But it's it's built into so as they go through and learn each of the mechanical processes and they learn a new tool, we try and build opposite building safety and all that. Because some of the equipment that you use, I've seen your labs, uh, actually you can lose a hint. Right? Yep, yep. So we've got like lathes, we've got um, drill presses, we've got a pan brake. So you could, you know, there's pinching hazards, there's potential hazards so you know there's appropriate safety equipment and yep. stops and stuff built in and uh rigorous testing to make sure that they're hopefully safe as they use them you know follow safe work procedures but it's important very very important <laughs> yeah it wouldn't you know there's no point having a student who's good at building robots but suddenly has no more hand right <laughs> it's just, that's a poor choice the aesthetics are getting better but <laughs> <laughs> you know, you isn't that Matt Buffer or who else did that yeah Matthew <laughs> Yeah, Matt Buffer, yeah. Buffer, okay. Yeah, he did a good... Yeah, that's right. He built the little hand and with... It was with uh, was it with brainwave control as well? He didn't getting the brainwave control to work. Okay. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. Uh, I saw... Uh, we don't yeah. topic now, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was watching... Um, because I, I've got another course on quadcopters and right. uh, my constructor found these videos showing people controlling a quadcopter with um, uh, a head headgear yep. mm. and thought... That's crazy. Capturing device and you could get it to rise, move uh, left and right, and then land it safely. I think, that's amazing. Amazing. I think I think in the last few years, a couple of companies, maybe on Kickstarter, brought out sort of USB 
think it's yeah, software yeah. packages. Yeah. So I bet if he gave the the hand thing another go, he would certainly be able to, Probably, able to do it with yeah. the available resources now. Those, they, like um, there's armbands uh, that actually can uh, measure electrical activity in your muscles, and they can use that to really? control. I've got one of those actually. Um, Myo 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 armband. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's something similar to a headgear that captures electrical activity in the brain. Tell you what, if it's a uh, if it's a game with some sort of arm mechanism this year, maybe we'll go for one of those for controlling <laughs> it the robot. Is very futuristic. <laughs> yeah, um, Saskia, future question. So I understand that you want to become an engineer. Uh, is that something that has, I suppose, grown as an ambition of yours because of your involvement in the robotics team, or do you feel like it's always been there that you always wanted to become? An engineer of some kind? I've always been mathematically and science wired, um, so I've always been interested in the science side, but it was definitely robotics that turned me to more the engineering side with biomedical engineering I'm really interested in and space engineering. Right, biomedical and space. Yes. What, what sort of... <laughs> Very different. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine biomedical engineering in space. Space uh, suits. The and... space suits, but also you know, medical mm -hmm. emergencies in space. Mm -hmm. um, um, we've seen the movies where you've got a robot uh, surgeon. Is that yeah. kind of stuff that excites you? Ah, uh, yeah, definitely. I'm really looking forward to studying that at uni and going further. Do you have a course in mind, a specific uni? Uh, not really. I'm kind of just still looking around. I've got a year or so to decide, so plenty of time. Yeah. So going forwards, you're going to be an engineer. How do you, f apart from the pure engineering, how do you find involvement in STEM type education where to a large extent you've been very lucky because you've been able to shape your own learning in a way. So you did, did not have to stick to a particular curriculum were able to explore knowledge topics that you were interested in. Um, how do you see that have a evolving, once you get into university, for example, just to make things simple, university even today tends to be kind of rigid in the way that students learn. Like in my university years, I had to go and pick up my five subjects, do the appropriate assignments, do the exam, and then move on. It's very rigid compared to your, what you're experiencing now. How are you going to deal with that? Um, so I think what a few of the Sydney unis have, which is really fantastic, is a flexible first year program for a lot of the engineering um, teams. So you do this flexible first year, you do all the math that's involved in the engineering, but you don't really um, study how it's applied. And then at the end of the year, you decide which course you want to go into and you just join that year. Um, seamlessly, which mm. is fantastic. So there is a lot of freedom there as well. Yes. Is that what you're experiencing, Alistair? I'm sort of more of the approach that it's, it's it is very rigid. Mm. So especially in the I think the first and second year, it's you know go to go to the lecture, mm. go to the tutorial, do the exam, and there's not especially for me there isn't really much way to sort of apply some of the stuff I've learned to that, except for maybe like time management. So it has been sort of hard for me. I'm a very hands-on person, yep. trying to trying to cope with something which is extremely lecture-based and you go in there, a room with 500 other people and you mm. go an hour later and you can't ask any questions because it's so busy and it's regimented. So that's been hard. Do you tinker outside university? Like, do you got your own pet projects? Or are you involved in any uni clubs? No, I'm actually not involved in any uni clubs. Um, but I'm looking to do that next semester. I'll probably do that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got any pet projects? Like, um, uh, you probably don't have a basement. Yeah, I... I had one. <laughs> yeah, I always, I always like tinkering around with robots and I built a battle bot earlier in the year to, mm. to attend a competition in Sydney at Vivid yeah. and I'm also working on starting an electronics business as well. Right. Do you want to tell us something about your business? Or is yeah. it too early? So it's, to, it's sort of to fill a, a void in the market for the first robotics competition parts. So there are a couple of different suppliers who are all sort of vying for a market share. There isn't really a lot of competition because they've all sort of got in their own sort of zone. Um, and I think there are a couple of places where there could be some niche products a lot of teams could benefit from to give them access to that, such as sort of solving problems where existing they need is like a cable and then another board. Um, and I've got like an all-in-one solution as well. Um, so is it like of, a hardware? Solution? Yeah, it's mainly just like a, a PCB-based solution. Yeah. Awesome. I'm sure you can find 
some robot you tested on. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus, rapid fire questions. Oh, one more. I just yeah. wanted to know, you know, in the past you were making the robot. How do you not mm. get tempted to continue to make the robot? Oh, I'm absolutely tempted. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I really want the students to sort of do things my way, but you've got to, you've got to really be able to differentiate between, you know, what you want to do yourself and, you know, what's in their best interest. So I could design it, I could tell them everything, but they're not going to learn from that. So rather I would allow them, why don't you consider this? Or have you looked at these different options? So they've still got all the opportunities to make the decision. Um, so you don't, you really don't want to take that away from them because building the robots, the whole decision process, mm -hmm. you know, them deciding what element of the game they want to specialise in if they want to do a particular thing in a particular way, it's, it's their decision. Okay, awesome. Mm. Do you do teaching soft skill? Um, not really, because I don't really have much time these days. So I've helped out with the VEX a couple of times, but uh, no, I'd like to get more into that after I finish the HSC. So it's um, alumni, I suppose. You can come back, yeah. become a mentor. Yeah, There's something that you're interested hoping in. to do that, yeah. yeah. Suppose, uh, do you find teaching a good way to learn? Yeah, definitely. Especially doing something like, like the, the CAD workshops mm. where mm. I, I do things and I don't necessarily do things the right way. I have my way. And it's really interesting to see the kids learning and, oh, oh they use this shortcut, shortcut. Yeah. oh, that's neat. Yeah, yeah. Or they use that key and that, that's neat because they've maybe been looking online at forums themselves because I try to get them to put it on their own computer so they can go home and, and do things and mess around with their home. Um, so, yeah, it has been really beneficial. I've learned a lot from doing it. So it's something that... Is there an educational version of SolidWorks? Yes, there is. Um, and normally Sorry. students have to pay a hundred and so dollars, but SolidWorks and a lot of other companies are really supportive of the first products competition. So yeah. every you can apply for licenses and every student involved and every mentor and teacher involved can get a license free from SolidWorks. Wow. Well, so the criteria for that is to be a student or to also be in... To be, to be associated with the, with the robotics program. Even right. people from my uni, if they, they wanted to learn SolidWorks, they have to pay $110 for the license. Mm -hmm. oh, right. That's even the same for something like MATLAB as well. Yep. Yeah. So, in, in general, uh, software vendors do offer the software for either yeah. free or at a very low price. They're incredibly the supportive. Students. Incredibly supportive. It's good to know. Like, I know and that Adobe the, does that. And absolutely. Yeah. So, Adobe offer... You know, all cloud their suite. all their cloud suite for different education. Mm. Um, SolidWorks offers their stuff for free. Autodesk offers Inventor for free for a lot of the. There's, there's phenomenal support for the program as a whole. They see they see the benefit in the future, so it's great. Right. Can you tell us a couple of people, one or two people, real or imaginary, <laughs> that you really look up to? Could, they could be engineers. Like oh. yeah. Let's say Nikola Tesla, just to throw out a name as an example. Real person's rationale. Who do you look up to? Probably Elon Musk is <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. That's what I said. Yeah. Like. <laughs> you know, I keep going. Um, it's fantastic that he's created a solution for not like electric electric cars, and he's just invented so many fantastic things. So that's really great. The business mind behind a lot of technological innovation, right? Mm. Yeah. Because as far as I know, he's not an engineer himself. Oh yes, yes. He is. Yeah. yeah. When he started PayPal, again, we're talking about Elon Musk now. Let's put another 10 minutes. So he did physics, but yeah. at PayPal, he was not an engineer there, right? Well, you know, or what I thought he was on the engineering side. I could, I could definitely was, be wrong uh, about this. Right? Peter Thiel. It's Peter Thiel. Yeah. Peter Thiel, yeah. Yeah, he's actually one of my role models as well because he's sort of, sort of linking the whole engineering side with the philanthropy and all the working to create a business. Like, he, he sees... Um, for example, his new project, I think it's called The Boring Company. Um, <laughs> he sees, uh, in 20 years, the world could be like this. So he's like, I've got all this capital already. I've got all this money. I can put that towards this. Um, and he can change things. Like, the, he's doing work into tunnel boring machines to do that. Mm. And they bought a commercial tunnel boring machine. And they're wanting to get the, the feed rate and the cutting rate 10 times faster than what they have now. What they have now. And just think about the impact that that would have just near Barker, they're building like a Penny Hills tunnel and it's, and it's taken maybe three yeah. years already yeah. Yeah, to get ten times those cutting speeds yeah. to do to a project like that. It would also be a lot cheaper as well. So you're thinking in terms of improving performance of a lot of the technologies but by orders of magnitude. Yeah. So imagine the impact that they would have both in like completing big works like that and the costs associated 
the impact on people's lives. Do you guys read? I was going to say, do you read any books, books that are not textbooks? <laughs> yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, I read quite a lot, but it's kind of hard, especially during exam time right now. So, that's, yeah. Can you remember the last book you read? My choice. Not... <laughs> My choice. It was not a textbook. <laughs> yeah. I, I had that problem as well. Like, I don't remember when it was. A lot of factual reading. <laughs> that's a hard one. What about you, Mr? I've actually recently read, I don't read too much, but I read a book which uh, my dad gave to me called uh, The Silk Road, and it's about mm. sort of the history of humanity and how, you know, the world's grown from just a, a place in the Middle East and it's all expanded out and how they used to trade routes. And it's pretty interesting looking at now China's actually looking at doing a sort of a modern-day Silk Road to mm. Europe and this big highway that they'll transport things through. So how the world became a village. Yeah. <laughs> They're not thinking about it. They're just doing it. This <laughs> is the thing I love about China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It just gets done. Are there fire questions? All the easy ones. Programming language of choice. Yes, yes. Tell us. What's your favorite technology? Oh, it could um, be programming language. It could be, I don't know, prototyping technology. Te technology. Or yeah. Could be a cloud service. Like, you guys have to collect a lot of information from a lot of different places. How do you keep track of all that? Do you take notes on paper and pen? Or? <laughs> um, so with the robotics team, we use Bitrix. Uh, yep. which is an organization software, which is really good. So is it also like a personal tool for collecting and archiving information, retrieving it? Like I've got in mind something like uh, Google Apps that allow you to you know, collect information, search for stuff, Evernote, for example, Trello, things like that. Um, a little bit. It's more for the connection of the team, Bitrix. So we mm. more use mm. Google Docs, Google stuff Docs. like that to track information. I don't actually do a lot of sort of organisation myself. I'll save yeah, I'll things and suit places <laughs> on, my, on my computer and then I'll, I'll back them up on a separate hard disk or a USB stick so I don't lose them. Yep. Um, but I, yeah, I, I try to keep things offline in, in a way. All oh, right, so you, you download, like, a, you might find a PDF document or oh, yeah. some a data sheet and you download it so you don't have to constantly search it on Google. Well, I, if I'm looking at a data sheet for like a IC or like a, a chip, I, I just download that and I yeah. keep that um, because they've all got really weird names. Um, I might rename it to say what it is right. because that way you can look through them later and be like, oh, I was looking for that and you can find them easily. Yeah. It's a, how, what do you use? Marcus? I have a system. Uh, Dropbox for everything. Dropbox, yeah. Dropbox. Yeah, pretty much my whole home directory lives in Dropbox and iCloud these days, I guess. iCloud, yeah. I use Evernote a lot. I keep clippings of websites and uh, even um, even uh, I do have a notebook, a paper notebook and I can take snapshots of that with my phone and it goes into an Evernote mm -hmm. and then it does optical character recognition so then I can search in my notes which is something I find very useful. It's so much easier to be a student these days. Yeah, I know. Oh yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good. I remember when I went several years into university this thing called an iPod came out. <laughs> And it was revolutionary because I could keep a whole semester's lectures on one device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, technology. Yeah, I don't really use Google Docs so much for my work, more for collaborative work, because mm -hmm. when you have six subjects, it's kind of hard to have like folders for everything. I keep it more on my desktop. Mm -hmm. yeah. How digital is your study life these days? Like, how, what percentage is paper books and what's Google and online resources? Um, so I find I try and make it 50-50. So a lot of my teachers do prefer writing in books and some of my teachers keep it all online. Um, but I do find it helpful when it especially comes to exams. I do write everything out uh, paper because I find it helps me mem mem memorize stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I try and keep it 50-50 as much as possible. At uni, lots of the assignments are sort of typed the you know, submissions are typed. Also, textbooks. I haven't actually bought any textbooks this semester. I'm just using the PDFs. Yep. And they've also got a whole <laughs> sort of changed. online <laughs> yeah. management system. And also, um, you can even watch the lectures online rather than having to online. record them. You can, yes. you can watch. You can watch the whole thing. So, so you your lectures will video record themselves. Or there's, actually, there's actually a system. There's a company. It might be an Australian company called Echo. Yeah. Which does it for a lot of the universities. Ah, really? Yeah. It's like a, it's like a website. So you don't have to go to the university login. anymore. You just. <laughs> Just log on but with you, a video. It's, they don't, you don't get, so if, if you're doing maths, they don't actually put like the stream of the 
person writing it out. So yeah. it's actually oh, really hard. The, the end result <laughs> yeah. from the whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can't really. Yeah. Well, so you got to go. That. That's lazy. I think that she did a whole video. <laughs> okay. So I guess one last question. Very quick one. What's the one superpower that you have? One thing that you can do that nobody else can do. Uh, ninja power. I'm, ninja power. Power. Yeah. I think I'm really good at envisaging things, how things will fit together. Physically speaking. Yeah. Awesome. 3D imagination. Yeah. I'm very hardworking, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think that's probably, yeah. I've just got probably a high work ethic. I'm working 24 seven practically. Don't really have much free time these days, but it's worth it. It's hard to beat. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Really Thank appreciate you. it. It's been fantastic. That's all for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions, please send them to our email address, questions at stemiverse.com, and we'd be happy to answer them. Do you want us to interview someone in particular? Let us know. Visit us at stemiverse.com to get the show notes of every episode. And subscribe on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That is S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.